Hi everyone, this is the Shop Still Podcast, episode 15 of season 3, and it's also the season finale. So in tradition, I'm going to start by introducing my two co-hosts. Joey, how are you? I'm good, Robin. That's good, and Brian, how's it going? Good, good. Feels like the last day of school. Yay! <laughs> right? And right on our shirts. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Robin. Welcome to the last show of season three. So, who wants to go first? What are we going to talk about today? Um, metalwork. <laughs> metalwork. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's end on a bang. <laughs> yeah, we. I don't know. I guess we can just sort of do a bit of a, a review of the year that was and. Um, the different people that we've interviewed and the projects that we've worked on and what we've been happy with and where we see our businesses and where we see where we see the podcast going in the next year. Okay. We were just talking before before we started recording about we were sort of going back on all the episodes that we've done. And clearly we do this in the evenings when we're all very tired after work. And we actually had to go back in the podcast app to see all the people that we've interviewed because we've just yeah, a lot of a lot of the stuff has just evaporated in yep. the, the the hustle bustle of day to day. So, um, but yeah, firstly, one, firstly, thank you to everyone who's come on the show. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool to hear so many people of different backgrounds and how they've got into the craft. And so, yeah, mm. I think we'd like to keep that going in the future. Like we we do like doing the interviews. Yeah, yeah. it really does make you feel a bit more of a community yeah. rather than just stuck in and you shared by yourself and this was the first season where we actually opened it up to other people to give us suggestions about mm. who wants to come on the show and, and after that show i had a number of people contact me and, and just <laughs> exactly what i was talking about i remember getting all these people messaging me a week later after i'd we had published it. <laughs> like, what are these for, people? For, forgetting what the episode was about, <laughs> getting all these people just suddenly, you know, why don't we have this person, that person on the show? Um, and so, yeah, so I think we'll keep that up. So if anyone's got some suggestions, obviously. Would, sorry, we, the, uh, would Whispers not replying to any of your emails, Robin? No. No, no. <laughs> no, um, it's kind of a yeah. quiet. He doesn't and, want to get up at 2.30 in the morning. And <laughs> 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 so actually, bollocks. maybe we could, should we, should we talk about that? I don't know if you guys remember that one American um, yeah. person that we were going to get on the show. So this is just a little bit of background or behind the curtain talk. We had almost lined up John Peters to come on the show. I'm sure a lot of you will know John Peters. He's really big on YouTube. And unfortunately, just with the time, the time difference, we just we couldn't do okay. it. No. And I'm so annoyed because John, just from the conversations I've had, he seems like such a great guy. Maybe, maybe next season we can work on that. How did we get the COC, COC girls to work? How did that? Did we do that middle of the mm. afternoon and it was late at night for them? No, I just think that obviously they're in a different part of the States and so the timing worked better as well, yeah. I think. But I can't even remember. I think it was late for me, really later than normal. Must I'm pretty been. sure that was in the day because we oh, started, yeah. it was, that, so that was season two that was when I was taking a very cheeky long lunch break <laughs> and, and I when you were doing to... when you when you were doing paid podcasting oh, that's right we were doing them in the middle of, in the afternoon weren't we yeah and it just yeah. got too much because I couldn't I couldn't with my day job I just couldn't keep it up so and unfortunately because that's why we had COC um, Neil Neil you yeah. know we could do all those guys but now when we're recording mm. the evenings and that's yeah. that's one of the reasons why we've brought this season to an end is because of the the time because it's now six thirty for me, and it's just too early in the in the evening to record. Yeah, that yeah. that and the fact that we're about to come out of lockdown in Melbourne for the first time, I'm going to spend a week <laughs> in pubs. I'm going to be <laughs> in no fit state to run face a podcast. Down in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exciting, eh? So it is. Do, do they have a date yet? Uh, it's looking like the second of November at the minute. They're a little bit ahead of schedule. Mm. So just in time for my fortieth birthday. Uh, nice. nice one. Yeah. Do you have something planned, or are uh, you still not sure a, if you want to go that route? Right? Uh, we're trying to get away somewhere. So yeah, I'm trying to get up to the Murray River the week before, but it might be ambitious. We'll see. We'll see how the date's looking. 
But yeah, uh, they finally got the the vaccination thing on track here, which is good, and looks like New Zealand's coming right as well. So it's mm. coming okay. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. in the uh, I think enough people will be vaxxed that things open up. Yep. But uh, you know, the powers that be at the moment seem to be changing their mind every day. Something different happens and is reversed and changed, and so we just kind of going with the flow. Yeah. It's just all these things. Like, I think of all the exhibitions and things that have been cancelled that people have spent months or years preparing mm. work for. Like, I know there's one at Craft Victoria at the minute that um, Alexander Postano and a few others are in, and it's it was due to open, I think it was two days, or it might have even been one day after lockdown started in Melbourne, and then it got extended and extended and extended, and yeah, I cannot remember the last time that I went to an exhibition mm. yeah so it'll be fun to see those come back I don't know whether the big kind of trade shows are going to make a return next year I have people mm. pestering me trying to sell me floor space at them for oh, yeah. way too many thousand dollars mm. and they seem confident that it's going to happen so I guess we'll wait and see I was talking to John Madden from Timbercon the other day about yeah. uh, wood dust yeah it, you know is that going to happen next year? Are they, you know, are we going to be in a position where, no, I guess not so much, because I, I would like to believe that Australia will be ha- doing that next year in terms of where we are with our vaccinations. But there's all there's all this planning that goes into it, bef- you know, a year before mm, the show. Yeah. So are we going to be a year behind still? And then, well, you've got a feel for the organisers as well, because, you know, no one's got a crystal ball and mm. if you need to plan a year ahead for something and you invest God knows how much money to make it work, to get it to that point, and then a month before, a week before, suddenly we're back, you're back into lockdown. It's like, what? what the, yeah. What's going to happen? I mean, if, I don't even know if lockdown's still going to be on the table. Um, anyway, who knows? So. Who knows? I heard yeah. something very interesting on the on the, the radio this week. I've just remembered in relation to the end of our ranty podcast last week or, or the, the the show before with about um moving uh shipping and, and moving timber uh, around yeah. because mm-hmm. of you know what we're cutting out <clears throat> there was a news article about how the in in the states it is now cheaper to bring goods in on a shipping container leave that shipping container empty send it back to china and then bring more goods in because of how cheap it is to get things in from China, whereas in the past they would it would come from China into Los Angeles, they'd fill up that fill container it, yeah. and send it somewhere else. Now they don't even need to do that because it's just cheaper to send an empty container back. Is it cheaper? Oh, well, because hmm. that is happening here, but I don't know that it's because it's cheaper. From what I hear, is that the the boats don't want to wait to have the empties loaded on or even have any cargo really like there's so there's such a massive stockpile of empty containers um because the boats Mm. just aren't hanging around to load up because there's three more in the bay waiting to come in and unload and they're just sending them out empty essentially with only a few exports maybe because it's cheaper than having them just sitting around maybe that was the point of the article possibly yeah but i just thought it was i just thought it was interesting because we were talking about how we're going to have to import timber mm-hmm. and maybe that's one of the the mindsets is it is so cheap no environmental not me but it is so cheap to import mm. i remember as part of like i always i'm a bit of a fan of promoting the local thing and trying to get something that's close to you and whether that's your food or just anything you consume try to get it as close to home as possible and i remember as part of my architecture degree in my first year of architecture school was um, we had to calculate the embodied energy of something small. I can't remember what it was, but it was just a product and you had X amount of steel, X amount of timber in it. And the amount of embodied energy in terms of carbon and in transporting and manufacturing was frightening. Mm. And the analogy that the lecturer gave was, okay, you've got the problem of you need to dry your hands after you go to the bathroom. You can either use paper towel, paper towel, use a recyclable cloth that then gets laundered or use an electric hand dryer what consumes the least amount of energy (laughs) 
That's a good question. It's a very good Ele- question. Electric hand dryer. Is it? Really? Yeah. So the amount of water required to pulp paper to turn it into mm. paper towel, the transportation of getting the yeah. you know, hand towels to and from laundromats and things. So there, it's just, it's kind of going back to this whole point of native timber logging. Like it seems like a bad idea to cut down our own trees, but there's ways that you can make it work. And I've had loads mm. of people actually contact me this week and ask me to send them through some resources on it. Mm. Oh, cool. cool. And I'm I'm finding some, but I'm trying to get some that aren't certified by um, FSC. So I'm I'm trying to find some papers that aren't industry sort of right. supported. Backed. Yeah. Mm. So trying to find, but um, yeah, so I, I will. Source. Exactly. Yeah. So as the anti-vaxxers say, I'm doing my own research. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, I'm going to collate them together somehow, and and I'm I'm actually interested to go down the route of calculating how much a piece of furniture, um, mm. how much energy is it in a piece of furniture if I make it from black butt versus making it from Murba or making it from American walnut or something. So mm. that yeah, would be, be really a, interesting. Really, yeah. really, really that interesting. would be an interesting little. Little project, yeah, yeah, because I think it's going to be a pretty scary difference. Yeah, mm. you're looking at well, anything that comes on a boat, yeah, is uh, that's a whole lot of diesel, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I wonder what it would be like in from a uh, from a carbon perspective, from in, in terms of carbon sink, in terms of if you are cutting and drying your own timber as well, because then yeah. you would assume that your footprint is nothing, but you are removing a a tree from. You know, you are removing a carbon. What would you yep. What would you call that? Sponge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a carbon store, or carbon sink. Carbon store. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, one. it's a bit, that's an interesting one as well because again, like people can greenwash the shit out of this, and 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 in some ways, the whole plant the plant a tree thing can sometimes like companies just jump on board and they just plant a tree for the sake of it and they don't look at who they're giving their money to. Mm. Whereas I specifically look at the people that I give money to and I change who I give money to as well. Um, but yeah, there's like the first step of sustainability is build something that isn't going to be thrown away. So you're reducing all the embodied energy in crushing something up for landfill, then building another table and you've got the carbon store of the timber that's in that table that could last for a hundred years. So that's a way better approach to sustainability in my eyes than just bake everything out of out of plantation pine. <laughs> build better, build better stuff, make it better, design it better. There's that's a, sustainability. There's a psych a, a a term in psychology now where they you get a, a basically a fatigue. Uh, there's a, a, a word for it where it's a an, an environmental anxiety or, or fatigue where we, just as the, the consumers sort of at the bottom of the pyramid, are constantly hammered with this idea of we need to be making the difference. We need to be fixing it. Mm. And it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we used, it used to be that there was no such thing as recycling. Then recycling yeah. became the thing. Now it's mm-hmm. about reusing. And it just feels like we are continually going to be this, the source of that problem. And it's, yeah. it's terrible because of conversations that we've, we're having right now. You just, we're going to finish this podcast and, go, and I'm just going to go, I am, I am literally destroying this planet. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> is I'm, I'm, I was born to destroy. I have a Stop breathing wrong. Uh, exactly. I have a friend who's not having two kids. He's only having one because he he believes that reducing the population is a is a good way to go. You can't fault the guy, but that's the impact that this is having on people. I thought like that too. I was going to do that. Mm. Well, first I wasn't going to have any kids. There was no kids. I'm not going to. And then it was oh, I'll have one. And then I'll fucking <laughs> have two kids. <laughs> Where the problem? I'm going to keep my mouth shut just in case my wife listens to this podcast for Fair the enough. first time in months. So <laughs> I'm not going to incriminate myself on this. Uh, yeah. But um, but yeah, like bringing it back to furniture, I think <coughs> the salvaging of materials will continue to really grow. Um, mm. As supply chains get trickier, as material resources are de- um, diminished, like the demand for recycled timber is going to go through the roof, and as mm. is the price. 
So build better shit. <laughs> yes, there's a t-shirt. Yeah, <laughs> probably already exists. Probably, yeah. yeah. Bloody wood whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about recycled timber, I have pulled my steam box out of storage, and I've been Ooh. yeah working on this project where I'm starting to just bend these these little strips. It's just a very great uh, gentle bend, but. I've got so I've got about six different piles of timber. So I've got um, mango, I've got some Vic ash, and then I've got some Morton Bay ash, which is recycled. Now this timber has probably been sitting in a wall cavity for fifty to a hundred years. Trying to bend this stuff is a nightmare because it is so brittle. When you, I, I can't think of an application where you would ever want to use this. You know, you talk about recycled timber. Is there a way to take that timber that is so old and dry and splintery and actually use it? Well, we had, um, well, for, for the purpose you're talking about, no, we talked, no. to, yeah, I mean, we talked to Byrne and, he, you know, he soaked his, t- his timber to, like, he gave it a couple of days in a bath before he steamed it and then he could bend it. And um, he wrapped it in newspapers. Yeah, or wrapped, yeah. wrapped it in cling film or something like that. Cling to, film, that's what it was. To keep it steamy. Um, so anyway, for that purpose... There's your answer. I don't know if it'll work, but it might help. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it depends what you want to make, I suppose. And mm. that's what my problem with recycled timber is that mm. there's never enough, I find, of... There's never enough of what I need for the job because mm. recycled timber comes in drips and drabs and... And, and half say, of it's just splintery mess. Like, it's, well, you can see yeah. it, it's exploding from the, you know, from the inside out. I find it very difficult to plan how to use, like, how do you price up how much you need to buy? Mm. For a start, you've got to deal with nail holes and stuff. So generally, you, you if you're using recycled timber, you say to the clients, well, there's going to be some defects in there that we can't do much about <coughs> because it's of its nature. Unless you're, unless you're milling down really large timbers and you're essentially getting new wood. Um, but if you're just getting some old floor joists or something, you're going to have nail holes, it's going to have checks and splits, and you're going to have to either keep them all in the project or cut around it. And I just find it almost impossible to price, mm. like how much am I going to have to buy, and then where do I find enough of it in one go that it's all at least the same kind of colour? And Yeah, and I was going to say the know. tone variations and the fact yeah. that structural timbers would just tended to be hardwood and they just fire a whole load of different species in together mm. that's right i mean yeah. typically you'd have the same here at least typically you'd have the same species on one house but if you had to mix say timbers from two different houses they're almost certainly going to be two different colors just because of the the dust that they they suck up and depending on where the timbers come from and the were they exposed to the dirt underneath or were they in the mid floor or something they're going to be quite different to work with or at least to look at look at um, but if you're if you are going to be um, using recycled timber you are you you're going for that look do you know what I mean it's not yeah. it's not necessarily a, about getting the timber to match or about removing yeah. those holes it's just about you have you got the recycled the recycled look <laughs> what is going on there Joe jeez is that rain yeah <laughs> I've been messing with my headphones for the last couple of minutes I was trying to work out what that was uh, jeebers jeez that's proper rain yeah well it doesn't help them in a tin shed <laughs> <laughs> I saw a piece on Instagram this this week by um someone who I, who I follow and, and he makes some beautiful stuff but he's made a piece out of recycled timber and I looked at this piece and my first thought was ah uh, because you could see all of the holes and you know you could just see that it was recycled and I guess maybe the the the, the client goes through a journey where you start with a pine uh, coffee table that's just been nailed together from all angles and, and it's furniture and then you go through that rustic phase and then you go through the recycle phase and then you end on what what burn is making in in terms of chairs and not to say that it has to be in that order but i feel like the re- the recycled look is a is a stage because I think you, there's ways you, there's ways around it there are creative ways where you can deal with things like nail holes in the way in which you mill the timber, whether, you know, 
um, the way COC do those kind of inlays, those geometric inlays, like there's things that you can do like that. I use um, recycled Jara on my pinch benches and I just put the nail holes going like perpendicular to the, so they're sort of sandwiched in between timber so you never see the end of it. But from the top of the table, you would never know that it's recycled. So there can be ways, I know what you're saying though, like most floor joists that you buy are just consistently nailed every 450 or 600 and you've constantly got to deal with those nail holes. But um, I think there are ways that you can you can work around it. But there are going to be challenges that we've got to face. Mm. Yeah. I can't think of a, of, a, of a top level furniture maker who is using recycled timber. No. Because I, it feels like your career naturally doesn't, end there you it's end interesting. somewhere else it's certainly food for thought because it makes me wonder um, my, my first thing I go to is veneering um, it seems like the best use of if you happen to get some timber that's not, not complete garbage and not full of too many holes the best way to maximise it is to veneer it um, because I'm not like if you really if you, I think if you really want people to um, kind of grasp onto using recycled timber, you've got to get away from the quote unquote recycled look. Timber doesn't have to be beat up and nasty, like like Brian was saying. It, it should be just as nice as if it were fresh timber. And it's just a matter of I guess a choosing to build things that you that are easily made inside of the constraints of nail hold timber um, or finding a way to use that timber in a different way i.e. veneering that means you can get more yield out of the good parts of, of the timber that's available it's an inter- interesting kind of thing to mentally go through the process and see what could what could come out the other end what you been working on Joe? Jesus you said you had a story that, for this one for this week well so my dad has a friend somehow from his tennis club or something how old did story story start yeah (laughs) so i've been roped into making this kitchen i was gonna say did he either have something cheap to sell you or was he asking (laughs) you to do something on the cheap so it's like an old there's nothing the client she's fine lady she's got money she's paying for it but what it's boiled down to is that because dad is going across the Auckland boundary border to the new house, he can't be involved in the job anymore. And he was kind of going to be the lead, essentially the lead contractor and organize everything. So had to go to site today and meet a bunch of new people at like the drop of a hat and say, this is going to happen tomorrow and this is going to happen to the next day and all this is going to be removed and I'm build, starting to build the kitchen like today. So like, you know, stuff's got to happen. And, um, the problem with this kitchen is that it's essentially a hexagon-shaped kitchen. Uh, the house is an old 60s thing that's been, quote-unquote, architecturally designed and not necessarily in a good way, but there's angles every bloody where, and there's steps up into the kitchen, and there's angled steps cutting into the kitchen cabinets, and it's just like... You know, I saw pictures of it and I was like, okay. And then when I actually saw it, I was like, what have I got myself into? <clears throat> so I've been back twice now to template it and take measurements. <clears throat> and the measurements my measurements aren't working and I'm trying to draw the model and it's it's just not, just not measuring what it should measure. And I've, you know. <laughs> Joey, Mr. I only go and take measurements <laughs> once. It's gone yeah. twice. <laughs> This I want to go back job. again, but I'm not going to... I actually do have to go back for a third time, but <laughs> I've got to wait till part of the kitchen's been demoed so I can actually take some measurements. Do you template, Joey, using the um, like the MDF or Masonite strip and hot glue kind of approach? or uh, well, Essentially, or? by use super glue and activator. Yeah. Um, and typically, I have, I have very rarely actually done it, and this is like one of the few cabinet-making jobs where it, like it's essential that I have a shape of this crazy step slash wall junction on multiple areas of the kitchen where there's no good way to measure it. It's not until I got the templates back to the workshop and I can put some protractors on it and like, what are we dealing with? Um, so yeah, 
I've only the only other time I've made templates really like that is when I was doing the van fit outs mm -hmm. and kind of just again super glued them together. I think the hot glue is good, but it does still move a bit. Mm. Like yeah. it's still kind of soft, and the, the super glue is just harder than the MDF, and it's not, oh, just, it's not coming I, apart. If I'm doing it, I'll hot glue it and staple it. Oh yeah, and that works pretty well. Mm. If it's messing out anyway. You need um, to get one of those lasers that the um, yeah, the CAD uh, lasers, the architects and um, mm. drafts. Or does it actually draw it from from a laser? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah you can get them. When we were looking to get our carport built, mm. the guy designed the carport in our backyard <laughs> by bringing one of this. It was mega expensive, but it's a laser that spins three hundred and sixty degrees in all directions yeah. and essentially maps the so you can build within that space huh. i mean you probably don't want to spend that type of money it <laughs> yeah. can't uh, templates much cheaper but that'd make it there's a, a, like um kitchen bench top guys there's a range of different ways they template um they've got a, there's a whole different range of um devices i've seen from lasers to this kind of mix between a analog and digital where they have a string that pulls out with just like a steel pointer on the end of the string and the computer measures how far, how much string has been pulled out or cable. Mm. Oh, and, okay. and then you just point the your pointer on the end of your string to your different corners in the room and it does the trigonometry to work out mm. huh. what, what shape you've just kind of pointed to and then that's the size they cut the bench stop to. Um, it's pretty cool, mm. cool little tool. Um, that was, that's the the precursor to what you're talking about, where they couldn't map it out, but they could kind of teach a computer a shape. You know. Mm. I have to say that on the subject of lasers, I finally bought a laser measure this year. I had I, I used one loads for doing site measures in architecture, but I bought like a fifty dollar Bosch one, and it has been fantastic. Is that the laser is, level? Uh, just a laser measure. So you put it on the wall and it tells you from that wall to yep. that wall. What it, yep. Okay, yeah. And it is like millimeter perfect. I used it on um, that built-in job that I did with the, the plywood in the apartment and mm. um, all the walls were twisted as buggery. And um, yeah, I I left the site measure like you, Joe, Joey, going, oh, I wish I could go back again. <laughs> and I was like, no, trust the measurements, trust the mm. measurements. And as I was cutting it, I'm like, should I just maybe do another mill shy? And I have to say, I'm, I'm really, for a $50 investment, I'm very, very impressed with it. Mm. Well, that's good. I've always been reluctant to trust a laser. I think yeah. it just, it's just one of those things you've got to jump into. But yeah, I just kind of, I did sort of four, three or four measures at each point and would take the average of the measurements. But, um, yeah, the variance in them was <coughs> tiny. So, yeah, <laughs> recommend. Uh, the other good thing that happened to me today was that I've had this giant kitchen sitting here ready to go, and because of lockdowns and everything, I couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And the clients finally decided that it was better for me just to ship it to them because it's out of the Auckland area. I can't go, I can't deliver the kitchen or install it. Mm. Um, but we all decided it was better that they at least had it in their house and then they can work out if they're going to install it themselves or have someone help. So Would they all, be able to? Um, it's pretty straightforward. Right. And I, we labelled everything like IKEA style, so I'm pretty sure they could put it together. Mm. But that, I think the client said they're going to have a, a joiner come around sometime this week and try and put it together for them. Um which was just good to get it out of the workshop. It's given, mm. given us some space. It actually feels like I've got a workshop again. And um, unfortunately, the truck broke down on the way, so then they had to get roadside repairs, and they were like three hours late. And uh, all the normal bollocks you get with moving companies who smash things about. Um, one of the units fell off the back of the truck when they are unloading something. Oh, so I'm not, not even sure what the damage is there, but yeah. Fun times. At least it's not in the workshop. So, would you consider doing that more often with a, a, a flat pack mindset? A flat pack what? Sorry. A flat pack mindset. So you're building your kitchen. Uh, with yeah. Name, yeah. Well, this wasn't flat packed at all. This one was no. just like yeah. four cabinets. Um, I don't think I would do flat pack. 
it's quite difficult to get it right. Um, well, not even necessarily flapping. Set up for it, but I would definitely sell a kitchen. Yeah, yeah, I would. I'd, I'd do it in that style again and just build the boxes. And if if you go into the project with that in mind, you can build them and design the kitchen in a way where you don't have to put too many fiddly bits in. Mm. Um, and yeah, I would do that and considering what the situation is at the moment with moving around the country that may be something that I have to do anyway um, it's surprising again I, I, I just hear it all the time I've been contacted probably two times this week um, it's only Tuesday I've been contacted already um, with people who's, who are trying to get plywood kitchens and they can't find anyone to do it um, so the, just it's always coming in is your Adelaide Adelaide job happening? Uh, I'm still waiting on a price for shipping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Dealing with the shipping company is like dealing with like the government. You know, <laughs> it's like <laughs> slow. <laughs> How's the timber holding up, Brian? It's no. It's no, good. No bumps it's actually, or no. Has been no, kicked or anything? No, not yet. So it's being shot. Um, it's being shot this week. Mm. So that'll be good. Um, but no, it's all, it's, um, it's stayed really good shape. So yeah, no, no movement in the timber and yeah, just looking forward to getting it installed. So mm. it's definitely been, I, I, I don't know, in terms of highlights of pieces that you guys have made, what, are, what, what would you rate as your favorite piece you've made this year? I'm trying to think oh. back. I made that kitchen island bench, which in itself is not a particularly complex build but what it did force me to do is cross into the building side of things because i had to uh, uh, consult with an uh, an electrician to run Mm -hmm. cable through it so the leg had to be designed with some conduit running through i also made the cabinets so it's a it's a kitchen island bench with cabinets on the kitchen side and a seating on the other side the cabinets on casters so you can roll it away and make it a uh, six seater high sitting dining table so the actual build itself not particularly complex but the 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 thought behind it from a from a living space perspective Mm. was quite quite interesting not something i'd done before that's cool what about you joe um i i think the um the exo stand I made is probably the most interesting thing I've built in a long while. And I was just thinking about why I thought it thought that. And I think, you know, going into it, I thought I would probably, I wanted to do something that I could enter into a, a competition, whatever that might be. And so with that in mind, well, every step of the way, when I was doing all the joinery, I was, more fussy than I think I typically would be knowing that it has the potential well yeah it has the potential to be seen by other woodworkers like in person if I was going to show it anywhere or something and and so right from that point of view I was more meticulous I think than I would be if um, I was doing work for a client but that's that said if a client wanted that piece I would have to be just the same amount of uh, meticulous as well because it, everything's exposed so you don't there's no way to hide anything really but um, it was a different point of view for me to come come at a project that one was completely personal to me like personally designed and had didn't have to achieve anything it was just a um, a folly really yeah but, passion piece yeah and so I think being able to just um, dive into something with and make it up as, as I go and make changes just based on how I thought at the time and how I felt about the piece, I think it was an interesting interesting project. You don't want to bring up the 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 blue door. Was that not your <laughs> 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 Whatever happened to that? I don't I, I think you said that you were gonna remake it and then that was the last we spoke of it, maybe on purpose. Uh, I remade the door out of well. The one thing, one benefit of that whole process, like I lost money on that, that job. <laughs> um, oh god! Um, 
I, I remade it out of yellow cedar. I don't know if you've ever worked with it. And because I didn't want to use red cedar as a front door, it's, it's just going to turn into a dense city. You know, it's just so soft. And um, so I was kind of hunting around in the timber yard and the guy said, oh, we've got yellow cedar. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I'm going to have a look. Um, it's much harder. It's, it's I, probably harder than pine, I think. Um, it has a much, I think, a much harsher smell. It's pretty bad on the old nostrils. But it, the, the closeness of the growth rings is insanely tight. Um, and just dead straight. I, I mean, I bought a 5.4 meter length of like 200 by 50 and it just, just dead straight, stayed straight. Didn't want to move, which is exa exactly what you want for, um, a door. And I think the piece I had was cortisone as well, which is, is just so beautiful. Uh, and I had warned the client that because we were using cedar, we, you're probably going to see, uh, the grain through the paint, but none of that happened. It just, it painted perfectly, um, like just a perfect flat finish. So it was my new favorite timber, but it's quite expensive. So it's not gonna, so much my favorite. I was going to say, is it easy to find? <laughs> because Brian and I've never both never worked with it. I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Yeah, I don't. I don't actually know anyway. what it's commercially used for. They don't seem to stock a lot of it. Like almost all timber joinery here is made out of Western red cedar. Western red, yeah. Um, or yeah, exotics, exotic hardwoods. I mean, well, all cedar is exotic, really. But um, yeah, I don't know what its commercial purpose is exactly. But it's just a really nice, straight grained, perfectly suitable timber. And I'm not even sure if you meant to make doors out of it, but it worked. Is it uh, is it similar? Like, is it used for cladding buildings, doing weatherboards mm, and things? Possibly. I mean, it could be used a little like latch, I suppose. But yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it probably would work fine. I just don't really know anything about it. I just yeah, picked it up I because it was harder than Western Red. I haven't really um, seen much of it here, but I'm looking it up. It's it's a beautiful color to it. Yeah, it's so blonde. It's mm. like really consistent. Um, and yeah, I, I remember working it. I was cut cut the tenons on it, and it's just like butter. Like it's just so crisp, and the joinery came out so nice. It was actually a shame to paint it all but that's typical for me i suppose I yeah. paint doors. <laughs> let's not talk about that again um. <laughs> but yeah that job turned out to be a bit of a bastard um what else happened on it um i can't remember mm. but i did a bunch of work for the guy and there was some fussy things happening happened to i can't remember exactly oh <laughs> Before we've got to talk about your kitchen guy. Your, hey. your. Are we legally? Are we legally allowed to? Millimeter man. I'm not sure that these things seem to be raised. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, Brian, Change what have the subject. You, what have you worked on this year? That's been <clears throat> life changing. Um, yeah, it's been a weird old year. Like I've had patches where it's been so busy. Um. And then other patches where we've obviously been in huge periods of lockdown. And then I had six weeks off work with a knee reconstruction. So yeah. it's been a really, mm. really weird year. Um, in terms of pieces I'm happiest with, probably um, uh, the tambour door mm -hmm. or the tambour um, cabinets. Um, I did a coffee table that was kind of half finished last year. And then I went That's to New right. Zealand and then finished it again this year. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The the Jaja -ja coffee table, which it's kind of I like pieces that have real inbuilt meaning to the clients in it, and that was done for a birthday present commission for a wife to her husband, and it was all about mapping the landscape of where they lived. And that's right. I know that it 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 has a real special place in in their home, so I really I love pieces like that. Um, but yeah, it's just been a strange old year. What are the, I forget the name of the table you're building at the moment, uh, the plywood... Um, oh, the ply parasites, yeah. Parasite table. Yeah. I, um, can you walk us through what you're doing with that? Because now I, I've seen it before, but then I, yeah. recently you've put a piece on Instagram and I yep. could see all the strips. 
And so you want to tell people how you make it because so, by the sounds uh, of it, you do one strip at a time. Is it? Originally, the very first one was literally made with scraps out of the light butter um, plywood <laughs> scraps bin. So my workshop was next door to theirs. Uh, I didn't have any commissions at the time, so I was just sort of making pieces for the fun of it. And it was laminating one by one. Um, and it took an eternity. Now I've kind of got a system where I panelize it. And um, it's still, you obviously have to glue them one by one. Like I'm not buying them as an edge um edge laminated ply sheet right which you can buy you can't but, get now yeah um yeah i just i've used the pre-made ones and they're they're fine they're expensive and the stability issues in them i think when you get thin so i like these are 30 are they 35 36 mil okay thick, so it's quite a substantial thing so if i bought that as a sheet from from a ply manufacturer i'm not going to be able to lift the sheet so yeah, I just buy 12 mil um, birch ply, cut it into strips, mm. edge laminate it. So I build it up in sections. Right. So yeah, there's like the full length sections and then there's a slot section that has a shelf for a vase. And then I've got my timber inlay sections, which are made up in four separate pieces. And then they're kind of glued in with the, the timber interlocking. And then it's just whatever scrap lengths I have form the kind of the the bite mark out of the front of it right so it is a completely it's obviously i'm having to buy the materials now because i'm not unfortunately mm. located in castle Maine right next to to gem but <laughs> um yeah there's material cost in it but there's literally zero waste like apart from the curve width of the cuts to cut them to length uh that's it so yeah it's, it's so good Going back to reusability and, and recycling, mm -hmm. if I uh, yeah, don't think you use a heck of a lot of plywood as it is, but if you were like no. me and use plywood all the bloody time, yep. um, I, we've got so many offcuts of plywood that we just got to get rid of. Yeah. But for you, would that be something? Would you? I mean, it, I assume it would be feasible that you could just have those on the go, being made out of any offcut you had it would change the look of them considerably because you'd get all sorts of color variations and stuff, but that would be a use for... Yeah, you could do them out of... You yeah, could yeah, actually use solid off timber offcuts. And, yeah. Yeah. So it's um, an interesting concept where you can take just random offcuts and make, essentially, like you said, panelize them and then... Yep. And then make other things. You've given me some ideas because I have a stack of those lying around the shop. Um, yeah. And because you are... But joining them in places, you can use yeah. It doesn't matter because they're nah. Length is immaterial. Why aren't you using solid? T I just always assumed they were solid timber. It just started as as yeah because it was pulling materials out of a scrap bin that um, I don't know. Oh, it's just not a stability issue that you're sticking with. No, no, with no, fire. no. It was just a, a ready, readily available timber to me at the time, or not timber, but manufactured timber product. Um, yeah, I, I like the lines. I like mm. I like the fact that plywood is a very honest material. I'm I'm generally pretty loath to use it. I'll only use it where I have to use it. So like for backs of cabinets and places where there's stability issues. But when I'm using it as the primary material in a piece of furniture, to me it feels necessary to yeah to be honest to the material. So yeah, I'm quite a fan of it. You mentioned Jim just before from um, Like yeah. Butter. Have you seen this new machine? I was just about to talk about this. <laughs> My God. Go <Come> on, <laughs> tell us about it. So if anybody's seen this, the Kit Apart series that Like Butter do, which is obviously plywood shelves that then have solid Vic Ash um, uh, frames and dials that have a screw thread built into them and a cap so you can kind of reposition them reconfigure them how you want so Jem has done these on his cnc before so a big massive flatbed and there was just i don't know some the threads clamping, you're talking about. clamping mechanism yeah. yeah the threads so the clamping yeah. mechanism on the side of the cnc and then the cnc cuts it and then all of a sudden he <laughs> unveils this, this beast giant. of a machine that um him and and john another guy that used to work for them full time has built 
That's so um, epic. They have built this machine out of it's it's like <laughs> It's parts of a CNC. Yeah, it's parts of a CNC. So it's all sort of solid milled aluminium and it looks beautiful. And it's got two router spindles attached to it and a whole series of hydraulic clamps. So you feed the dial in, the dial comes down, router number one comes in across, cuts the shoulder on the dial, then cuts a deeper shoulder then router number two comes in and cuts the thread of the yeah. screw. Then the then the uh, pneumatics yeah, or hydraulics it release it, drop it down. down. Yeah. Then then a saw blade comes in, cuts it to length, and you're like, oh my god! I wish my brain worked like that. In fact, I, I don't because I'd never sleep. I've never seen anything like that. I've seen a lot of CNC machines, and I'm sure in maybe massive industrial plants there are things like that, which are custom-made yep. robots, essentially what we're talking about with this. Yeah. But the fact that you could just clearly see he's just taken components from an off-the-shelf CNC kit, yep. turned it vertical, and then built this whole other arm, which uh, God knows how it's working. But... Uh, it's thing incredible. And now genius. he's put his entire CNC that he was having to take out of service to cut those parts. That's back in service. And yeah. Yeah. Because um, I've, like, I think we've talked about it before, but we've played around with doing threads on the CNC here. Mm-hmm. And the amount of work involved, I, I can't, I, I, it's crazy how much work has gone in to. To make that machine work, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> scripting, the scripting of the software, and yeah. all that it's kind of stuff. So it's crazy! That's such a cool yeah. machine, and I don't think there's anything like it in the world, really. N- that's, that's I I asked him about it, and he he said that to get an equivalent that wouldn't really be tailored to what they would need it to be is about a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, fair play then. Yes, awesome machine. Yeah. Did you guys have Robot Wars Were in New Zealand and South Africa? Did you get a TV show, Robot Wars? Jeez, Jem would kill it at Robot Wars. <laughs> <laughs> He'd make a make robot that would just gradually dismantle the other one, screw by screw. <laughs> and package it up into a little box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Send it off for recycling. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just so cool to see small independent makers doing... Like really groundbreaking stuff like that. Ah, um, I, I'm just blown away by that. I'm really that. I my jaw hit the floor, and I thought, um, just bloody good on the guy's business is obviously booming, and yep. that is just awesome, awesome yep. to see. Yeah. You talk about supply chain issues and how they're able to operate from a small regional town, two yeah. and a half hours out of Melbourne when their clients are all over Australia, like that's, that's really impressive. Yeah. And I just see they've also just got another machine to make their own cardboard boxes to yep. fit their products. Exactly. Which is, yep. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> like, ah, oh, he's, he's hardcore, man. Yeah. We, we were there in the early days. Well, actually, no, we weren't there in the early days. I assume you've been going for quite a while before we spoke to him. Yeah. <laughs> we were there in the earlier days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was there. I see the day, the first day his CNC arrived. Yeah. So it's just amazing how far he's come. Mm. Good on you, Jim. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I guess that's. Uh, is that a wrap for the season? Isn't it? That's the end of season three. Awesome. So when are we whole, coming back? Do we know when we're coming back? A whole fifteen episodes. Um, I don't think at, we have at a, some point. At next some year. point, we'll next leave everyone year. hanging. Be, it will be next year. It'll just, definitely just be next year. Dub the date in here later, Rob. <laughs> yeah, it will be yeah. the insert date here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I tentatively, it might even be April, and it's. I've yeah. remembered now why we came back in April was because that's when the clocks changed. Uh, yeah. yes. So it's because little kitties uh, are awake. Yeah. For any parents out there, <laughs> you you know why the show is. <laughs> Um, gone off because unfortunately yeah we have some young or I have some young kids and 6.30 is right in the middle of bedtime and nothing gets in the way of bedtime with when you have kids mm. uh, so we'll see we'll see what, what the landscape is like next year but yeah it'll, it'll definitely be next year we'll go have some Sweet. 
go have a Christmas and then uh, regroup. Um, one, one thing I do want to just mention uh, before we, we end off, uh, just to do a bit of a punt for the donation link that we've set up now on PayPal. We do have a link on the, so it's on my website where the show is hosted on Robin Lewis robinlewismakes.com so if you are interested in donating to the show all the proceeds go to the show it all stays within the show so it's really just a way of um, allowing us to improve on the show audio quality um, you know maybe doing a world tour one day that kind of thing (laughs) (laughs) we can Um, dream I'd like to give a shout out to all the all the makers that have done it really hard this year as well like people that have been stuck in extended lockdowns in New Zealand and ACT and New South Wales and Victoria, like, I feel you, like, it's been bloody tough and the anxiety of not knowing where the next job's coming from, Mm. whether you're covered for government support, whether you're allowed to go to your workshop, whether you're allowed to have staff, whether you're... it's, It's been... It's been incredible. Like, it's been so difficult at times and then other times... It's just been a sanctuary, you know, to be able to go into a workshop and feel like it's life as normal as opposed to Mm. everybody else who's having to work from home on laptops. But, um, yeah, big shout out to everyone because I know that the anxiety is real and, yeah, it's been tough. Mm. So hopefully in 2022 we won't have to mention bloody COVID in every single episode. Fingers crossed. You know what I want? It should be a shot of alcohol for everybody who mentions (laughs) COVID in 2022. (laughs) Drink a lot of COVID. I want a footy season that's not interrupted. I just want to watch a, a normal footy season that ends in Melbourne and we can all enjoy it. <laughs> yes. And it's funny you mentioned the anxiety thing, hey, Brian, because um, a couple of weeks ago we talked about, we had a bit of a laugh about, oh, you know, we, we thought we were all going to be on the streets and, and we've all got through. And we have, but there's always been this uncertainty along the way. Even though yeah. we've got through, okay, there's, and that anxiety is, that's a big thing. I've definitely felt anxiety. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm a terribly anxious person, but in terms of, I've I've always taken my time to do things so that, like, I don't rush through things in a workshop, which is touch wood why I think I haven't had any serious accidents to date. But this year has been amplified. Like, I'm like, shit, if I, God, the timber yards are closed. If I, if I, stuff up this bit of furniture with this this one cut then how am I going to get that? and oh god the leather inlay has got to go down but the leather shops are like it's been really tricky and I've, I honestly find that making my new workbench like that's just that simple steel framed workbench and giving myself a real focus of production methods in the workshop really helped sort of calm everything down just take my mind off it and, and refocus so if anybody's struggling maybe maybe focus on a a small shop project, like reorganize a clamp rack or just do something that just gives you that little bit of gratification and, I don't know, stops you worrying about a client job. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, a good point. Yep. Yeah. No more mention of COVID next year. Everyone have a have an excellent hot vac summer is what they're calling it, what the kids <laughs> are calling it and our, our health minister in Victoria. Oh, nice. Way awesome. to be old, way too old to be using phrases like that. So <laughs> we're not allowed to anymore. This yeah. just yeah, it's, it should be illegal. But yeah, have a great summer, guys. Yep. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, well, in the new year. To everyone so, yes. listening. Oh wait, are we going to end like that? Yeah, no, you can do your do your spiel. I was, I'll yeah. do another see yous. This is amazing. I love the fact that this is, train is just going to head into the station on fire. Yeah. So <laughs> to everyone listening, if you enjoyed the show, please go ahead and give it a rating on iTunes. Uh, Brian and Joey, thanks again. And now we can say goodbye. Okay, see ya. See you guys. <laughs> see you guys. Bye. <laughs> that was beautiful.